right. Uh, well, uh, we're still having people join us, but we're going to go ahead and get started because, uh, oh, let me just uh, turn this off real quick. Okay. All right. Well, welcome again, everyone. My name is Winetta Ayers. I'm executive director for Commonwealth North. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for joining us at noon for this uh, session of the Fiscal Policy Study Group. With us today are Cheryl Frasca and Jennifer Johnston, who are co-chairs for the Fiscal Policy Study Group. And I'm going to invite Cheryl to say a few um, opening remarks and welcome our guest, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you, Juanetta. And thank you all who've taken time out of the middle of your day um, to join us. Um, Senator, um, this our policy, fiscal policy study group is focusing on some of the key um, pieces of a long range fiscal plan. And certainly um, use of the permanent fund earnings is key to that. Um, and our hope is to have a, a this all our work discussions during the session be followed by some citizen engagement ways um, that Alaskans can become more informed about the choices and trade offs uh, that are going to lie ahead or are before the legislature right now, um, and then uh, provide that input to uh, the legislators and governor. Um, so with that, we are interested in learning more about your Senate Joint Resolution 1. Um, and the constitutionalization of the dividend. Um, so we welcome you and, and we appreciate your time today. And uh, I'll turn it back. Juanetta will be the, 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 the ringleader or the moderator, whichever it is, um, as we go forward. So thank you again for joining us and we really do appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, All right Senator, the floor is yours, go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I think fundamentally, it it uh, just just in following this issue. I I know there are many people uh, in, in the in the room uh, on in this uh, conversation who have been at this a lot longer than I have. But I, I've sort of come to the conclusion that we're we're not going going to be able to move forward with any sort of fiscal plan until we resolve the dividend issue. And so I, I've actually uh, proposed uh, resolutions for over a decade now to put the dividend in the Constitution, even before it was vetoed. Uh, and, and so I, I have a, a few slides, which uh, if that's OK, I, I, I'd like to share. And, and I'll go through them very quickly and then open up for questions if, if there are any. And uh, OK, so everybody see my screen OK? Yep, we've got it. Great. Okay. Uh, so, so fundamentally, the um, uh, the we let's we'll start with the Statehood Act, and uh, Alaska is, as you all know, is a very unique state in terms of our resources. We we came into the state into statehood, uh, really not having enough of a tax base uh, to pro to provide revenue for our state, and so. As part of the Statehood Act, we were granted the subsurface rights, the middle rights, um, for our uh, public lands. And um, we, we actually, I, I hear people every now and then say, well, uh, if you're not going to give me my PFD, then give me my, give me my uh, mineral rights back. And, and you actually can't, because under the Statehood Act, uh, the, the state would forfeit those uh, minerals, uh, those rights if we did. Uh, and then the legislature, through uh, the creation of the Constitution, Put in a provision that uh, that the legislature is responsible for the utilization, development, and conservation of all natural resources belonging to the state, including land and waters, for the maximum benefit of its people. And Governor uh, Hammond has uh, spoken on this uh, when he wrote "Diapering the Devil" and, and a number of other occasions. Uh, and what his opinion was, was that, uh, this is a direct quote, I, I believe the best, perhaps the only way to meet our constitutional mandate to manage our natural resources for the maximum benefit of all the people was to grant each citizen an ownership share in Alaska's resource wealth to be used as they, not the government, thought was for their maximum benefit. Others, when the permanent fund was being created, uh, this was uh, the subject of, of some discussion. As you all know, in 1970, the state got $900 million when um, 
uh, the Prudhoe Bay lease came about, maybe it's 1969, I think the payment was made in 1970. And, um, and to put it in perspective, at that time, the state had a budget of around 200, 250 million dollars. So getting $900 million was just an astronomical amount of money. And the state, uh, uh, within about five years, had spent all that money. And so, uh, and, and you can say there were good things that came out of that. Um, I think there was a pretty universal frustration that it had all been spent, though, and that uh, very little of it, if any, was saved. And so Governor Hammond proposed to create the permanent fund uh, in 1976. He originally proposed to do it as uh, just simply a law or resolution. Uh, they found out that that bumped up against this, the dedicated funds clause, and so they needed to actually change the Constitution. There was uh, quite a bit of discussion, uh, and, and as part of the lawsuit that I filed back in 2006, I went back and I've listened to every single one of the minutes, read every single one of the committee records. It's, there's quite a bit that uh, uh, were, were destroyed or don't exist, but this was a letter of intent that was put into place by uh, Terry Gardner, who is the chairman of the, the House Judiciary Committee, and Hugh Malone was uh, chairman of the House Finance Committee. This was a letter of intent when the bill passed out of the House. They, there was quite a bit of talk about um, being able to pay out a dividend through the, the permanent fund. That was a goal of uh, Governor Hammond. And they, at, they uh, added some language uh, to the constitutional amendment in 1976. Uh, and they were very clear that they were adding that language for the specific purpose of getting the maximum flexibility for the funds earnings and paying out a dividend. In fact, they, they specified this, the purpose of the language in the last sentence of the resolution as the constitutional amendment in existence is to give future legislatures the maximum flexibility in using the funds earnings ranging from adding to fund principal to paying out a dividend to resident Alaska. So I know I've heard some people say, well, there was never any discussion of a dividend back in 1976. That's simply false. Uh, you can see um, uh, this other letter that was written by uh, Governor Han Hammond at the time, and this is 1976, uh, August 25th, several weeks before the election. And he, he states on the left, uh, he says, the purpose of this letter is to express to you some of my concern and thoughts on the proposed permanent fund for Alaska. He goes on, and it's a, it's a five-page letter. Um, but in the last paragraph, in the highlighted portion, he says, I envision this entity, either, he's talking about creating a permanent fund corporation at this time. I envision this entity to be similar to a corporation owned by all Alaskans, which would receive a dividend paid out of the earnings of the permanent fund. So uh, there was discussion there. When um, Clark Gruning spoke to the um, State Investment Advisory Committee on August 26, 1976, again, a few weeks before the people actually voted on whether or not to create the permanent fund, he, he also spoke to this uh, issue somewhat. And, and he says, there, there's also another area that is interesting. What do you do with the income that it says will go into the general fund? That was how it came down from the governor, unless otherwise provided by law, which would enable the legislature to either dedicate those revenues for the specific purpose or to require them to go back to the permanent fund or to have a dividend check to every Alaskan. So uh, after the people voted to create the permanent fund, it was uh, about a 66% uh, support for that, uh, then started the real debate about, well, what do we do now with, with those uh, earnings that will be generated by the permanent fund? And, and people wanted to do a variety of different things. There were people that wanted to uh, use that money for low interest loans. There were people that wanted to use those funds to build uh, infrastructure across the state. Uh, there was quite a bit of debate, of course. Uh, there was, the first bill was enacted in 1980. It was rejected by the United States Supreme Court as being unconstitutional. Uh, they went back to the drawing board, and in 1982, they passed what is the existing permanent fund dividend law. And um, here is a letter of intent that was put into the record by Al Adams, who was the chair of the House Finance Committee. The, the House Finance Committee room is, is the Al Adams Finance Committee room now. And so the intent back then, and which is still the intent today, because this, this statute still exists on the book today, is thus. The committee intends that the payment of dividends shall have first call on 50% of the income of the permanent fund available for distribution 
regardless of what other uses the income is put to. And the, fundamentally, and in, in speaking with um, Clintillion, uh, who was the Senate president when the permanent fund was created, and Rick Halford, who was the House Majority Leader when it was created, and Sterling Gallagher, who was a constituent of mine, who was also the Revenue Commissioner at the time the permanent fund was created, um, there was universal agreement that uh, this uh, created a dedicated fund. In fact, the legislature didn't even appropriate the funds from the um, earnings reserve uh, to the people. They just automatically transferred for, for the first several years that the permanent fund was in existence. Um, that practice later changed, uh, was subject to the court case uh, that I was involved in with Rick uh, Halford and Tillian. The court said, no, it's a, it, uh, it violates the dedicated fund. It, it would violate the dedicated funds clause. And so, so here we are wrestling with this issue now for the last six years, uh, since 2006. Uh, what, what, what should the dividend amount be and how do you resolve this issue? And so, uh, again, I've been sponsoring this resolution for 10 years. I think the only way you resolve this issue is by putting the dividend in the Constitution. Uh, just, just a few items on uh, the impacts of the permanent fund. And you all know this, I'm sure you probably, many of you have seen this. This was a Institute of Social and Economic Research report, ICER, uh, that came out in December, 2016, the impacts of the PFDs on poverty in Alaska. And they found that it lifts about 25,000 Alaskans out of poverty. And, um, and you can see the, the varying statistics. It particularly impacts Alaska natives, it particularly impacts rural Alaskans, it particularly impacts those under 18. And, that's pretty much what I have on, on the resolution, uh, you know, for a presentation. What, what, what this resolution fundamentally does is it, it, um, it says that uh, um, the, the permanent fund dividend is put into the Constitution, and then there's a payout, which is either 5% uh, uh, of the average market value of the fund for the first uh, five to six preceding fiscal six years. So it's basically a 5% PUMB. Um, or 21% of the net income, uh, wh whichever is higher. And, um, and then the remaining portion uh, that is left. Uh, so in other words, uh, uh, you, you, five, you don't pay out 5%, you pay out half of the 5%. So it's, it's basically creating a, a POMB. Um, and then the remaining funds would be available for government. So um, I know there's a lot of different ideas out there on how to resolve this issue. Uh, I, I think it uh, certainly for my constituents, um, it, I represent east side, lower uh, income area. This is a critical issue for them. And uh, it's, it's uh, an issue I still hear about. I asked my constituents, uh, knocked on probably down to 36,000 doors over the years. And, um, and this is certainly an issue that I get quite a bit about to, to this day. So, uh, that I'll stop right there uh, and, and happy to discuss this more answering questions if I can. Great. Sounds good. Thank you, Senator. Well, um, we'll uh, I usually call on the co-chairs for any initial questions while other folks are formulating their questions. You can put your question in chat and I will convey that. Or um, uh, we do have a, a smaller group online. So uh, I, I will offer the opportunity if you raise your hand or turn on your camera, I'll call on you as well. But let me start with Cheryl. And then I'll go to Jen, uh, Jennifer. So Cheryl, go ahead. Sure. Th thank you, Senator, and appreciate your your sharing with us the the history. We'll walk down uh, memory lane uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, from where this all came. Um, so give it, giving it context. Okay, I appreciate the the historical perspective, but do you have analysis that if this was in place starting in um, 2025, um, what that would mean to state revenues um, in terms of the ability to pay for current level of services or future increased costs of services? I, I do. You know, I'm going to share my screen again. again. Okay, so uh, so this it, okay, this is a kind of, kind of a busy screen, and um, let's see if I can make this. 
All right, there we go. A little bigger. Okay. So th this is from the governor's 10 year plan that was submitted uh, recently. And this shows the looking from the top up, upper, well, look at the top line. It's got FY 2023, which is the current fiscal year, which ends on June 30th. And then uh, going forward, FY 24, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is assuming a full statutory dividend is paid out. And, 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 what you, and yes. Um, can I ask you to uh, hit the from current slide button, from current slide, the next one over? No? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. There you go. Yeah, and, yeah that's, that's a little bit better for folks. Thank okay, you. great. Yeah. So um, I don't, do you see my mouse moving around when it yes. moves around? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so up here you have the fiscal years. This is the traditional uh, U, um, UGF uh, revenue that's uh, projected for the next decade. And then uh, this is assuming a full statutory dividend. And so um, uh, FY23, we, we had a surplus last year. So um, that going in FY24, you can see what the fiscal impacts would be. So in FY2024, it would be a $259.9 million deficit. And then that would grow uh, to $608 million and $909 million. And you can see the impacts all the way across. Now, if you go to the next slide. Um, this is with the governor projecting uh, new revenues. This is from his proposed um, carbon sequestration bill, and and he's projecting three hundred million dollars in FY 2024, five hundred million in 2025, and we can see the numbers projected out. And so with that, you're a little bit short, but for the full statutory PFD, um, you're you can see that impacts on the CBR and on uh, the SBR. Uh, which is basically the SBR is basically depleted now, but it it has a it maintains a roughly a two billion dollar balance on the constitutional budget reserve, which is um, about what they need. So, are you comfortable with that? Are you supporting the carbon sequestration? Yeah, I you know I um, uh, we're hearing that right now, and and I'm. Uh, I look forward to further analysis of it, but um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that there's an opportunity for us to get uh, several hundred million dollars or, or more from uh, lands that uh, we're not currently using and um, help the environment at the same time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, if somebody else has another question, otherwise I'll... I have a follow-up. Go ahead, Jennifer. A <clears throat> um, couple of things, and I'm afraid both Cheryl and I were here during that whole discussion. We do remember some of it. There's one thing just in editorializing that when we, the history is given as far as Hammond, um, I think folks forget of the pre-Zobel dividend and, and Hammond's approach was, was as much about about building longevity in Alaska as a dividend. And if you can remember, it was $100 for every year you lived there, um, unless you came before statehood. Um, and I think the first one was $1,100. Um, but it, it increments grew with your longevity and then it was capped. Um, so it was a it was a different dividend. It ended up being non constitutional, but that was his approach, and that was as as important to him as anything. Um, but my question is, uh, Larry Persley had an interesting piece this last week um, as far as the fact that we won't have to pay taxes, federal taxes, on our energy dividend or energy. And he suggested, you know, <clears throat> why aren't we looking at doing something like that with the dividend? Because we, I mean, and I remember Uncle Ted trying to get us a special federal exemption for our dividend, but we there is a large amount of the dividend goes to federal um, taxes. And, you know, have you thought about that? Yeah, it, you know, it was kind of shocking that the IRS did that. I know when I, well, I it's it's been it's been there forever. 
they, they've been doing it forever. <laughs> well, I, you know, when we did that. I mean, for that, mean for the giving us a, a, a break. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall that when, uh, when Governor Palin was here and we issued a special energy dividend. Yeah. I don't recall that. No, IRA. they didn't do that. You're right. No, yeah. they didn't yeah. do that. Then. Yeah, so uh, I think that's I think that's worth some exploration if there's a way to save taxes. I mean, quite frankly, yeah. I, you know, I, I think the, the important thing with the dividend, and I hear this from Rick Halford and, and I used to hear from Clem all the time, was just, just keeping that link to our resource wealth. And um, so I, I worry a little bit about breaking that link, but, but at the same time, if you can save um, some pretty significant taxes by sort of reclassifying it, I think that's worth some exploration. And and it then brings it to more of a need space, but it, it would have to, it would change. Um, yeah, how we looked at it. I just think it was an interesting, interesting approach. Yeah, I, you know, I worry about doing a needs based uh, change. Um, and, and the IRS didn't make it needs based this time, but they just said, we're going to, we're going to tax it. You know, we're not going to tax it. Um, but if it, it, it was sort of a modified needs. It, it 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 seemed that their approach was because of the huge impact of fuel or energy that this was needed for the population. So it was a more generalized than than actual needs base. Yeah, because they didn't say they didn't limit to income. They didn't limit to, no. limit to portions. They just of the said that this was a unusual circumstance. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. If you could figure out a way to do that, <laughs> so that we didn't have to pay tax on it, that'd be fantastic. Might have to change how we calculated it, though, and what it was. But anyways, just a thought. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, uh, Senator. Uh, the the uh, carbon uh, market uh, revenues that are proposed as a part of the governor's long range plan, um, I I know one um, area of discussion is that most of the other players in the carbon markets generally take um, sometimes a decade or more to get into the market and find the right partners and establish revenue systems. Uh, in terms of what you've heard so far, um, is it realistic to expect positive revenue from carbon markets by FY24? It's, it's gonna take several years, there, there's no doubt. And um, uh, we, we do have other opportunities for, for revenue that can close that gap and, and I can- uh, Yeah, go ahead. Share share some of those. Um, so, so, um, let's see if I... yeah. Okay. So, so looking at, uh, this is, I'm looking at the, the tax credits that we currently pay for, for the oil industry. And, um, and so when, when Senate bill 21 passed in 2013, uh, there were these tax deductible tax credits were added. And so as you can see in, in 2023, uh, we're allowing um, $1.13 billion in per barrel tax credits in 2024, $1.2 billion in deductible tax credits. So it's $1.2 billion per year. And then we're also uh, have these carry forward Credits, which we're allowing, which are $880 million in FY 2023 and scaling up to over $1.7 billion by FY 2029. Um, so uh, I, I think there's an opportunity for us to, to, to cut some of these tax credits back. You know, when, when Senate Bill 21 passed in FY in, uh, 2013, it passed out of the Senate with a $5 tax credit and then it was increased on the last day or so on the house to an $8 tax credit. That's worth about $470 million per year alone. So, I mean, if you just cut those $3 off the tax credits, which by the way, the Department of Revenue Deputy Commissioner for Dunleavy testified last year, you can cut those and it won't hurt, it won't hurt investment at all. Um, that can save you $470 million per year going forward. 
on, on top of that, you've got uh, Hill Corp, which is incorporated as an S Corp instead of a C Corp. Uh, and that's costing us $120, $130 million per year. So yeah, there, there's absolutely other areas you can cut with absolutely no impact at all. We've had independent experts testify you can cut these tax credits with no impact. We've had the Dunleavy administration testify you can cut these with no impact. You can gain easily six to seven hundred million dollars just by just by those two things right there. And that's not even considering the carbon sequestration. Okay. Um, again, for the audience, you can uh, put your questions in chat, or if you want to turn on your camera, I'll be happy to have you pose your question directly. Um, and I'll ask uh, Jennifer and Cheryl, too, if you have any. Cheryl's got another question, it looks like. Sure. Um, going back to your slide where you talked about the impact on low-income families in Alaska. All right. Back in the early days, um, the uh, Aid to Families with Dependent Children uh, program, um, the concern was if they got the families got their dividend, uh, it would determine them to be ineligible for welfare. And so the legislature agreed to use permanent fund earnings uh, so that they could continue to receive their benefits. Low income families receive their benefits, even though they would be ineligible due to the federal rules. So that was the way in which the state came forward to help low income families um, with, with the benefit of additional uh, permanent fund earnings. So if the concern is that um, low income families are being harmed the most, why not come up with another program, another welfare related program? And it's probably going to cost a lot less than two and a half billion dollars um, if that's your primary concern based on your presentation slides. Yeah. Well, I, I could have added a whole lot of other different <laughs> slides. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was trying to keep it short. What you know, one of the one of the ways I, I guess I'd respond to that is this, and, and this is something that I've heard, you know, heard from Clem Jillian over the years and Rick over the years I've heard. And and, uh, and, it, and it's this is the, the people and even Governor Hammond said this was before we had the dividend, and even now, what you see is people who are very politically connected. People uh, they uh, get much more access to uh, state funds generally than those who aren't politically connected. And so, um, what 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 we're trying to do with the dividend, and in my mind, and, and you can read this in the minutes going back to the creation of the current fund dividend, what they were trying to do was to say every single Alaskan is an owner of the resource constitutionally. It belongs to the people. It's not like that in Texas. In Texas, you find oil on your land, North Dakota, uh, anywhere else in the lower 48, it's yours. You're, you're a millionaire, maybe a billionaire. But in Alaska, it belongs to all of us. And, and there are people who are very skilled, who are very good at going down to the legislature and lobbying to get uh, a larger share than all, than all other Alaskans. And so what, what this is doing is this is saying, we're going to give a tiny little share to uh, every single Alaskan, regardless of your uh, wealth, regardless of your status, you know, every single Alaskan gets this tiny little fraction. And when you when you when you look at the amount that we're getting from oil and the amount that's been paid out over the years, the state has gotten 100% uh, of the corporate income taxes, 100% of the uh, property taxes on state lands, 100% of the production taxes, and 75% of the royalties. What has gone into the permanent fund is it's a very, very tiny fraction of the oil wealth that the state of Alaska has received. We've gotten 25% of our 12.5% royalty shares, 3.125% of the value of the oil that comes down the pipeline. And, and so um, it's a small amount. The permanent fund has done an extraordinary job of managing that wealth. And um, I, I think it, uh, you know, it, it certainly lifts people out of. Um, out of poverty, but it also helps those who are in the middle class uh, pay for their kids' education. Now, my daughter, hers goes right into a college education fund, and it's 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 grown pretty substantially. And uh, yeah, some people use it to, to go on vacations, and 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 I don't have a term for that. It's 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 you know it's a tiny fraction of all the money we've received going to the people. I think it's one of the most popular, most successful government programs that we've had probably in the country. 
So um, yeah, I, I I would be reluctant to make it needs based and change it. No, and I wasn't suggesting the pro dividend program be needs based. That if your concern is that um, uh, low income folks are uh, inadequately receiving um, subsidies from the state, then you create another program to address that and fund it with permanent fund earnings. That was my point, not to turn the program into a needs based. So, I mean, it's a, a different needs based program, but appreciate your perspective. So um, maybe another question in terms of, uh, we heard uh, last week from uh, Senator James Kaufman about his proposed spending cap. And, um, you know, I've talked about, you know, the sort of the grand bargain aspect of maybe what's needed to get to a more durable fiscal solution. So, um, you know, you've, you've stood firm on this for a decade and um, you've, you know, definitely illustrated an, uh, an interesting historical perspective that um, uh, the dividend uh, discussion uh, was sort of concurrent to the creation of the fund. But what do you feel is the appetite in the body, uh, in the legislative body this year for the grand bargain, for uh, a resolution on these issues that have had us stuck for so very long? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I, I think it will happen. I think we were getting close actually last year and then oil shot up and uh, and you know, every time we get to the cliff and we're about to go over, I think we get very close to that um, decision or you know, a compromise, and then and then something happens to, to blow it up. Um, personally, I, I'm open to a, a spending, some sort of spending gap. Uh, I, I think um, I, I'm open to it. You know, the, de the details are obviously critical. Um, I, I think it's, you know, that's what. One of the, I think the advantages of having a large coalition like we do on the Senate side is it, it forces us all to be in a room together. And I know, um, I don't think there are too many people who would have predicted, you know, that Senator Diesel and I would, for example, <laughs> who, 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 uh, who uh, you know, she's very formidable. And uh, we we had many discussions over the years over over oil taxes, for example. And, you know, I'm willing to bend on, on, on the permanent fund. I, I think there needs to be a willingness to bend on different sides of the equation. And, but until that happens, I, I guess I'm unwilling to say it's gonna be an all dividend solution. It's, it's you know, we're gonna fill the government deficit with, with the dividend and nothing else. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to do that. I'm, I'm not supportive of doing that. I know my constituents don't, uh, as a whole, don't support that. Um, I think they're open to compromise. I certainly am. But it really, it takes everybody to compromise. Um, and a follow-up would be, uh, and maybe this is leveraging off of Cheryl's, Cheryl's earlier question, your chart uh, really indicates that that maybe it's 10 to 12% of the population that is being lifted up specifically uh, out of poverty or near poverty by the dividend. Um, and so really you've got this vast majority of Alaskans that look at, um, the, if, if not the permanent nature of it, at least the rigidity of a constitutional dividend and changing circumstances, meaning that they're increasing their risk of potentially paying taxes in the future. So how do you, what is your explanation that the, I mean, I, I well, I understand what your explanation probably would be about why the constitutionalizing the dividend is an essential step, but at least in terms of uh, people who who may be on the precipice of paying taxes because it becomes constitutionalized, what's the argument for the eighty eight percent that would convince them? Well, number one, I think if we don't constitutionalize it, it it will be gone. I think the the government will take it all. In fact, if you look at the history of the dividend from the very first year that it was created, the next year there were proposals to get rid of it, and just about every year since then, every, you know, or every couple of years since then, there have been significant, serious proposals to get rid of it because people have better ideas on how they would, how they would fund those things, how they would fund things. You know, some people would want to give it, you know, and, and it's on both sides of the political aisle. Don't get me wrong. Um, so I, I think, I think, um, uh, 
putting it in the Constitution from, from my perspective is a, a critical step. I think there are uh, many Alaskans who still rely on it. And, and certainly uh, there are people in the middle class who, who it's very important to. And uh, and, and and they would you know, certainly be uh, opposed to, to doing away with it. They rely on it for education, for the kids, for, for you know, food, for fuel, for things like that. So, so you know, I, I think simply doing away with it is is not something I would support. You know, in terms of the taxes, uh, that that was Governor Hammond's, uh, and quite frankly, Clint Tillian, you know, you, you would ask them, well, what's your solution? And they would say, well, um, if, if you need to tax it back, I, I guess, I, you know, I, I'm of the feeling that when, when I look at the amount of the, the tax credits we're paying out, you know, $1.3 billion in, in oil tax credits, that, that's the equivalent of every man, woman, and child in the state of Alaska giving up $1,800, $1,900 of their permanent fund dividend check to the oil industry. You know, at Prudhoe Bay two years ago, uh, we, we gave away $750 million in oil tax credits there. We got $86 million in investment, in capital investment at Prudhoe Bay. 70, let me repeat that, $750 million in tax credits for $86 million of investment. I think if you were on a board of directors for a, for a corporation that did that, you'd probably be fired. So I, I, I think, you know, we, we need to take a, a little closer look at what we're doing. And I guess I would just add, we're the only state in the country that has a permanent fund dividend check. And, and if, if we have to figure out other ways to fund our government, just like every other state in the country. And, and that would probably result in some cuts somewhere. Uh, it might result in some revenue increases. Uh, I don't think you need taxes on working people. I think, quite frankly, you can get you can you can simply do it by um, getting back some of the resource wealth that uh, we're not we're not getting what we should be getting. Um, I'm going to put one last call out, and I'll put out another question. I guess too is that you know I think certainly after the last few years, and um, we're we're realizing the fragility of our economy. And that's a very, uh, you know, a, a difficult thing where uh, we've, you know, lived through 40 years of affluence and um, maybe just only now are realizing the fragility of our economic activity. And that, in fact, a lot of our economic activity remains untaxed. It, can, it is only uh, possible because um, other revenue streams are paying paying the bill. Um, so as we look at, you know, uh, lots of conversations about strengthening the economy and, um, uh, you know, very real concerns over um, the viability of the oil industry of resource development in general, because we're seeing so many players lo uh, leaving the state. So, um, you know, notwithstanding all of the other conversation, um, if if um, even if we do away with uh, tax credits that that may not be essential to the prosecution of oil and gas in the state, um, how how can we convince? industry to come to Alaska when there may be, in fact, a, a larger tax bill in the future? I think that's the importance of doing um, a, a thorough economic analysis and, and making sure that any, any increases will, won't hurt the industry. And that's, I mean, the deputy commissioner of revenue who's done an analysis and said, you can cut these and, and it won't impact. We had a, our expert, who, Rich Ruggiero, who works for the oil industry, uh, testify the same thing. So, uh, so, so we know we can do it. I, you know, I mean, we, we just went through the ballot initiative a couple of years ago, and we were told if we uh, kept oil taxes where they uh, where they were, uh, we would save the dividend. Right? Just vote no, save the dividend. Um, I guess you could say that this this resolution is is uh, codifying that. Right? We're saving the dividend. Uh, I don't think anybody expected thought that when they were voting no. Based on those advertisements, we we're going to see the dividend slashed by two thirds. So um, you can look at the numbers. Um, I, I, I request numbers from our uh, um, Department of Legislative Research. Uh, it, it's an independent division. 
and every quarter on ConocoPhillips earnings. And what we find is that Alaska uh, typically is the most profitable oil region in the world. And it's not even close. So, you know, you can do the analysis and we've done the analysis over the years. And what we historically find is Alaska is extremely profitable place to do business. Nobody wants to chase the industry away. In fact, I spoke on the Senate floor three days ago in favor of the Willow Project and I worked with my colleagues to get a unanimous resolution for that because we recognize the importance of it. Um, but at the same time, we've got a constitutional obligation to get the maximum benefit for that resource. And when you're giving $750 million in tax breaks for, seven, for $86 million in investment, I don't see how that's following your constitutional mandate to get the maximum benefit for your for your resource when you're when you've taxed uh, corporate income tax. Uh, you know, a all the companies pay corporate income tax, and then you got a new player in who, just by virtue of the fact that they're incorporated differently, they escape 120, 130 million dollars per year in in taxes. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, you know, we, yeah, it, it, it's hard to say no. I mean, everybody wants to be the nice guy and give away everything. We, we can't afford to do that. Uh, you know, you, 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 there comes a time where you have to say, I'm sorry, we, we, we can't afford these generous tax rates anymore. We can't afford to have you paying zero taxes in the state of Alaska. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Wylikowski. I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions in chat, but, uh, I, I know that our, our audience has been attentive and, and uh, we appreciate your time today. I'm going to call on uh, Cheryl and, and Jennifer for any closing uh, remarks. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, once again, for your time today, we really appreciate it and for your insights into your the bigger picture that surrounds the dividend question, other than how much is it going to be. Um, so, so we do appreciate your insights. Um, so, Jennifer, do you have any closing comments? And if not, we'll um, look to gather again in a week or two. You're muted, Jennifer. Jennifer, you're muted. She's working on it. Enjoy the, enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you later. Great. Thank you so much. And Cheryl, I'll just add for everybody, we have confirmed uh, Representative Ben Carpenter for March 31st for discussion of priorities in the Ways and Means Committee. So we'll be getting that notice out to folks. Um, and that will be an 8 a.m. meeting. Um, so uh, please join us for that. And thanks again to uh, Senator Wylikowski. And I'll just add uh, Jennifer's sentiment, get out and enjoy that sunshine. It's very potent. So have Thank a good you, weekend, everyone. Thanks, Senator. Thank you.